Uh, I got scheduled as the last talk of the day, which is always exciting because I know some programmers are finally awake by this point in the day, so that's good. Um, and uh, I, I've got a talk that is based on what seemed when I proposed the talk like a really simple question. So uh, the reason I proposed it to a C++ conference rather than a conference that specifically deals with computer graphics is there is a 2D graphics proposal for the C++ language that was sort of my source of inspiration. So I figured there might be a lot of people who haven't really done a lot of graphics programming, but potentially that's going to become a more and more important part of the C++ language going forward. So they're interested in writing generic code that is useful in libraries, things like that. They're potentially interested in writing GUI applications, things like that, or 3D rendering code, and they may have to deal with an image. So what is an image? Better? All right. Hopefully some of you heard some of that. My talk is not about audio, so. <laughs> uh, basic terminology for this talk, uh, there are a lot of subfields and niches where terminology almost but not quite overlaps. Image, picture, pixmap, bitmap, uh, for our purposes today, these are all the same general kind of concept. If you have something like a photograph or a 3D rendering, uh, and that exists inside the memory of a computer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that a picture. Uh, in some niches, like an X11, a bitmap specifically refers to a one-bit image. In Windows, it's fine to talk about a bitmap being a full-color image. I'm speaking fairly generally to a fairly general audience that doesn't care super duper about the exact jargony uh, details of a specific niche. This is an image. It is a confused goat. Um, it serves as a good example. Part of the goat is white and part of the goat is black. So it shows a range of brightness levels. Uh, we call that luminance. The goat's a uh, little toy there that he likes to play with and his collar are red. So this is clearly a color image. Color is very useful. And uh, I looked very closely at the image uh, earlier today. When I looked at it, the screen, it looked like it was uh, made of very small little squares of different colors. Each square was a different color. And you can see it's, it's a two-dimensional rectangle shape. Uh, and this kind of gives us an intuition of what I'm talking about for an image. This is another image. It was published today by the US Consumer Product Safety Commission while I was flipping between Twitter and updating my uh, last tweaks on the slides. US Consumer Product Safety Commission, the most underrated meme lords in the US government. This is a real tweet from a real US government agency. Uh, but you can see this is made of multiple images. There is a baby's face taken with a different camera from the camera that was used to photograph the armadillo, put on top with some sort of a transparency mask, and then at the bottom, there's some text that came out of a computer, wasn't a photograph. Images come from different sources, they get put together. We sort of need to know how to make images from different sources work together. We can't just deal with one image. So I mentioned color, you know, the armadillo is on some green grass, the goat had a red collar. Uh, most people see red, green, and blue as the basic primary colors. If you learned in art school that it is uh, yellow is one of the primary colors or something like that. That's paint, not light. Normally when we're dealing with images and computers, we talk about mixing light. So when you add lots of lights, you get bright white light. When you turn off all the lights, you get black. So high numbers are white, low numbers are black. Uh, some people see differently. This talk is not about human perception. Actually looking at the images we're going to talk about is a whole other complex field uh, to a surprising degree. And then at the bottom, you can see kind of a rainbow. You've, you've probably seen something like that before. So let's start with a basic working definition of an image. It's a contiguous 2D array of little squares called pixels. Uh, we use red, green, and blue colors to describe it. Uh, so if we're using 8-bit values, we need three of those for each pixel, and it's in the memory of a computer. Pixels are accessed in order. Uh, this is a C++ talk, so we like to have pointers to areas in memory. Uh, if this was a Python talk, they'd be scared of that kind of thing. But we want to be able to work efficiently with an image, get direct access to the colors. We iterate through it in a fairly intuitive order. And then on the left, you can see kind of like if you've ever implemented a standard string, you have a pointer to your data, you allocate space for the data at runtime, and you need to know the size, and then you can run through it. And that's, you know, a good starting point. So 
Uh, now you know basically what an image is. Thank you for coming to my lightning talk. Genuinely with that much information, you know how to deal with kind of 90% of the images that you're likely to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The other 10% is gonna take a little longer to talk about, and we're gonna dismantle some of the assumptions in that first definition. Uh, so is it difficult to define what an image is? Surprisingly so. Like I said, there are different niches with different jargons. Uh, computers are pretty much all capable of dealing with images nowadays. If I was giving this talk in the late 70s or the early 80s, images on a computer would be a pretty obscure thing. Now all of you have a phone, many of you have a laptop with you. Uh, so there are more computers here that can process images than there are people in this room. Um, Game development has different concerns than visual effects for movies and television. GUI application development may care about different things from video playback. Uh, so it's very easy to talk at cross purposes when everybody's like, yeah, images, it's a, it's a simple idea, right? Um, and this slide is probably the most important takeaway more than any specific fact, like just if you're talking with somebody who works in a different niche than you, just like talk to them and make sure you're actually communicating about what you think you are. Uh, so the scope of this talk. Retro computing is really interesting. Like I said, back in the 80s, computers were very constrained. Not all of them could really do images and stuff. Um, we tend to think in terms of algorithms and data structures. This is super not an algorithms talk. I'm not gonna tell you what to do with the images. I'm just trying to describe the images. This is to an extent a data structures talk, but it is not that much of a data structures talk. It's more about what that data is. Uh, on disk formats like JPEG files or GIF files are really interesting, but I'm mostly talking about what happens once we load them into memory so that we wanna actually process them. Um, though on disk formats have some implications about things we'll need to deal with. And uh, this is gonna be kinda quick. I'm gonna throw some mildly crazy ideas at you if you haven't really dealt with digital images and computer graphics before. Um, that's okay. Uh, I get some of this on your radar, so if you're doing kind of library code, you'll be somewhat aware of weird use cases your users might happen, have, so you're not so surprised when they wind up asking you for a feature. And you'll have some terminology and some jargon that you can look up later, and if you download the slides, the speaker's notes has like some links to papers and things. So don't be super shocked if there's something you haven't run into and you're just like, wait, what is an imaginary color? And I go to the next slide. Uh, so I said retro computing is out of scope, but I think it's useful to give a little context to explain why some of this stuff is out of scope. This is Atari Battlezone. Uh, it is an old arcade game, and you'll see the picture is composed entirely of lines. In an old arcade machine like this, there is no buffer in memory that contains this image. The machines in those days were too small. They did not have enough room for what we call a frame buffer in RAM. There is just a list of lines to draw, and the only image is the image on the CRT screen while you are playing. You cannot get a pointer to part of this image and modify it in memory. The early Macintosh, interesting platform. Only one bit black and white, extremely constrained. One of the quirks about the video mode on an early Macintosh, because it was one bit, you could not get a pointer to a pixel. You could get a pointer to a block of eight pixels because each pixel was one bit, so each byte was eight pixels, and it is a byte addressable machine. That's really inconvenient. We try to avoid that kind of restriction and quirk in modern code. When we're writing modern C++, we, we don't like the idea that multiple data structures would share the same address. That violates rules in C++. Uh, also, one was black and zero was white on the early Macintosh because the mental model was black ink on a page rather than voltage going to a CRT to make the image brighter. The original Nintendo used tiled graphics. It's a little more like what we think of as a modern image. It's colorful, uh, but like the question mark blocks in the image, there's three of those. There's actually only one question mark block image in memory, and then there is a tile map that through indirection references the one image because the memory was so constrained. Pain in the neck to deal with. We don't like dealing with indirection. Very cache unfriendly on modern systems. We like to be able to draw arbitrary pixels. That's why some of this retro computing stuff is just like, eh, we're just gonna call that not an image anymore. Uh, another thing about really old systems that could display color because they were so constrained, they used palettes for their colors. So Mario was the same image as Luigi. You did not change the pixels to change Mario into Luigi. You changed a lookup table saying what those pixels represented. 
because the pixels in the image of Mario slash Luigi was just indexes into a lookup table. It wasn't actual colors. So if you want to change a specific pixel's color, you wind up with a bunch of weird constraints on that and you can't adjust that individually. Pain to deal with, we like direct real colors. Like that red, green, blue, we saw the color wheel. We have that mental model now, much simpler to deal with. The Amiga did a bunch of weird things with video modes. This screenshot is actually very hard to explain, but the top half is a different video mode from the bottom half. This is not one image. You could not iterate through this image in the memory of the Amiga. There are two images with different bit depths and different resolutions that halfway through displaying on the monitor, the Amiga would just jump to a different image. We prefer simpler things to iterate through. Uh, C++ developers will spend days writing complex iterators to make it easy to iterate through an image. We don't have to jump through different places in memory. The retro computing is out of scope for all these reasons, weird pointer rules, constrictions from not enough memory and storage, and weird restrictions from having to do analog output. There were these weird non-RGB video formats. We don't like that. So back to that definition we established. Now that we have it in contrast to kind of old school computer graphics, contiguous 2D array of little squares, not you know indirected through lookup tables and palettes and simultaneous different video modes. 8-bit RGB colors, i.e. the pixel actually has a color in it that we can understand as green or red rather than just this is color 37 and at runtime we'll decide if that's red or green. And then we can access them as a continuous block of memory the way you would any sort of large C++ object is a bunch of bytes. So I mentioned there are these little squares called pixels that make up the image. This is Mario, you know, he originated in old school graphics, but he's very recognizable when blown up uh, this large. You can see a bunch of squares. He's got buttons on his overalls. Um, clearly, he's made of little squares, right? Uh, Alvy Ray Smith in uh, the 90s wrote a classic computer graphics paper that I'd like you to be aware of with the most emphatic title of any formal paper that I know of. A pixel is not a little square. A pixel is not a little square. A pixel is not a little square exclamation point. And a voxel is not a little cube. Uh, voxels are also kind of out of scope, but they're a three-dimensional generalization of an image uh, if you want to uh, also screw with our definition of what an image is. This mostly affects what you do with an image more so than how you actually store it until we get to some non-RGB modes. But it's important to put on the radar that if you are thinking of little squares, your mental model is already wrong. Another thing that we need to think about with uh, what these pixels are. Uh, we talked about red, green, blue combining to make various shades of color. Uh, it is useful to combine images like the meme, uh, the baby's face on an animal. So it is useful to have some notion of transparency for an image. Uh, we'd use an alpha channel for that. I'm sort of skipping over a lot about how alpha channels were developed and how exactly they work and how exactly you composite. But it's useful to have red, green, blue, and opacity in your image. It makes the images bigger. 25% of your image is just transparency, wastes some space, uses more memory bandwidth. Counterintuitively, uh, when you benchmark simple image processing operations with this larger image format that has a bigger definition of a pixel that uses more space and memory, uses more memory bandwidth, you need to do more operations on it. Uh, it actually processes faster. A uh, simple benchmark that I did with a RGB pixel definition iterating through an image took about three seconds, or sorry, took about four seconds. The bigger RGBA benchmark of the same thing took about three seconds, even though we're wasting a bunch of space. One of our classic time-space trade-offs, we're going to run across a bunch of those. The reason for this is that alignment matters. Three is an unlucky number in computing. Red, green, blue is three values per pixel. If you have a line of pixels across an image, some pixels are 32-bit aligned, some are not. Consequently, when you try to load an image into a register in the machine, the memory subsystem of a modern computer has to do a bunch of work because under the hood, it's probably not actually reading individual bytes from memory at byte aligned addresses. It likes round numbers. When you are consistently reading 32-bit aligned values, uh, 
It's easier on the hardware, and if you get to the level of detail of writing vectorized code using vector intrinsics or hardware-specific vectorization, it's a lot easier to just make assumptions about alignment. Uh, your graphics card also works in probably at least 32-bit chunks and is going to go a lot faster with this generalized notion of a pixel. You'll still need to deal with RGB images sometimes if you're writing code, but you'll often want to expand into RGBA with 32-bit pixels instead of 24, even if you don't need the transparency. Uh, and then that's just zooming out on the benchmark for emphasis. Uh, so uh, there are lots of libraries and frameworks and things. Uh, one is called Qt. It's a, mainly a GUI library, but it does a bunch of other things. Uh, Qt has a QImage class. It's uh, kind of old school C++ by modern standards, but in the documentation, it mentions data must be 32-bit aligned. Each scan line of data in the image must also be 32-bit aligned. Qt tends to do things in scan lines, uh, and it's got pixel formats for uh, so you can define what kind of data you're loading into an image. Uh, Open Image IO is another library that I really like. Uh, it's not super common outside of visual effects and post-production, but if you ever need a library that is kind of full fat, reads lots of different image formats, supports lots of weird corner cases and edge cases uh, in a very robust way and has internal caching and things, it's a super cool library. Uh, it expects everything to be densely packed. It doesn't have this alignment requirement. What does that get us? Well, for that RGBA format where we use four components per pixel, these two libraries are compatible for their image formats. In memory, they will generate and read and write these same sort of images. So you can have a pointer of the data of one library pointing to the data from another library and use operations and functions from one library on an image from another works great. In RGB mode, it doesn't. Sometimes, because if the resolution of your image is at least a multiple of four in width, the size of a scan line is still going to stay on 32-bit multiples, even though a pixel is not a 32-bit multiple. So if you have a 64 by 64 pixel image, these two libraries have compatible memory formats for RGB. If you have a 65 by 65 pixel format, or 65 by 65 pixel image, that's no longer true. So if you have a really robust test suite of like, I tested a 64 pixel image, I tested a 128 pixel image, I tested a 256 pixel image, these are perfectly compatible. But your code accepts arbitrary images from users, uh, they'll do something you didn't expect and didn't know you needed to test. And if you are copying between these two libraries and they have different notions of how big the buffers used by the images are, and you are sending an image back to an end user, copying between these two image formats in the wrong direction will make one of these libraries think that an image is bigger than it actually is, and it will just keep reading off the end of the image. And you will wind up sending a user who is downloading an image from your image processing server arbitrary bytes from memory. Because every talk at CPPCon is a security talk. <laughs> No matter how much you were hoping, I just want to look at a picture of a confused goat. Uh, it's C++, so you can send arbitrary uh, bytes of memory to end users if you're not careful, even if you think you have a fairly robust test suite. All right, so we've talked a little bit about like a pixel, but we've glossed over this notion of red, green, blue. Uh, if, if you've ever had like a six-year-old ask what sounds like a really easy question, this is one of them. We're talking about a red, green, blue color model where people see that. What, what red, what green, and what blue? Uh, there's sort of a stereotype that if you go to college, your first year in college, your roommate will either get super high or take his very first philosophy class and be like, hey man, how do we know that we're all seeing like the same shade of red? And annoyingly, science dictates for like a whole bunch of reasons from different subfields, none of us are seeing the same shade of red. It's really annoying. Uh, but we need to nail down somewhat. All right. we, we saw this side earlier. We've got, like we all more or less agree it's white in the middle, red, green, blue. Possibly somebody here is colorblind, but they can probably still see at least two of the colors pretty well. Uh, the colors that they can see pretty well, they can make out and agree on. So how in computing do we decide which red is the reddest red. Uh, 
we use a concept called a color space, where we just define a particular shade of red, a particular shade of green, and a particular shade of blue as the primaries of our color space. And everything within those shades, how we can mix them, is the gamut of our color space. And the other thing we have to define in order to define a color space, and there are a lot of definitions, but this will work for us, is if you have red, green, and blue, what happens if you add more red, green, and blue? Uh, which is probably a bad way to phrase that, but we'll get back to it. So gamut and primaries. That weird horseshoe shape is the colors of the rainbow expressed in a fairly counterintuitive format. It's uh, called CIE XYZ color space. Scientists love it. Scientists are the only people who love it. Graphics programmers who deal with color stuff get used to it. There's the colors of the rainbow are down at the bottom there. The colors of the rainbow are wrapped around the bendy edge of that shape. Um, goes from red to blue along the outside. And you see a bunch of triangles there. And those are different well-defined color spaces. Some are bigger than others. Uh, the small ones are for things like CRT monitors. CRTs could not display particularly rich colors the way that they worked. The big triangles are for things like laser projectors. Lasers can show really precise, clear colors because they use monochromatic light. That old CRT monitors, if you put them next to a laser projector, they just don't look the same at all, completely different. Uh, if you don't show them next to each other, you might not notice, but they are very different uh, saturations. And when you look at an image on these two displays without compensating for that, they wind up looking completely different. You'll also notice that uh, at least one of those triangles completely exceeds the shape contained within the rainbow. You can mathematically define these color spaces in terms of kind of any three points, even if they're not real colors, because humans see in terms of three colors and three colors or three points geometrically define a plane. And if you have any two planes, you can define some sort of mathematical relationship between them. Uh, and there is absolutely no formal rule for defining the boundaries of what counts as red and isn't allowable as red and where you go. Well, legally, that's orange. It just, there is no rule. If you were hoping for me to give you like a real clear definition of how you pick red, green, and blue when defining the primaries of a color space, oh well, colors in computers are completely arbitrary sometimes. Uh, so are brightnesses. Uh, if I have one apple and you have one apple and I give you my apple, you have two apples. If you have 50% gray and I give you my 50% gray, you don't necessarily have 100% gray. There's a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, I mentioned a lot of the way colors work is defined in terms of how old CRT monitors worked. And if you increased the voltage in a CRT monitor, it would get brighter but not an exactly linear relationship to the voltage. So we came up with ways to compensate for old CRT monitors that are kind of related to the way eyes work, where we expand the color space using a nonlinear relationship. Uh, this one at the bottom uses a curve called sRGB, where we use more of the space for dark colors because our eyes kind of notice banding between dark colors a little more easily than we do light colors. So it's not necessarily a great mathematical relationship, but with images, we just want them to look right. Uh, and we're not always willing to waste a bunch of extra bits in memory to do that. Uh, transfer functions can be arbitrary, just like the definition of the primaries for the color space. We have a linear relationship where adding twice as much of something results in a value that is twice as high. We can use logarithmic curves uh, that's very common in the film industry. We can use a gamma curve, which is an exponential. If you know like big O notation for runtime, you're familiar with ex exponential curves and logarithmic curves. Same curves, just applied in a different context. And sRGB uses an arbitrary piecewise curve ar that is partially made of a linear segment and partially made of a nonlinear segment because it looks right on monitors in the 90s that we no longer use but we still need to be backwards compatible with those images. So on modern monitors and projectors, we still use it uh, because as much as I try to put retro computing out of the scope of my talk, uh, we're stuck with backwards compatibility forever. Um, all right, 
Color space, also one of those things, gets very squishy to define in different subfields. Nuke is high-end compositing software used in the visual effects industry. If you use the color space node in Nuke to transform between two color spaces, it asks you for the white point, which is a photography concept. I'm not going to go in great depth to it, but if you photograph the same object on a bright sunny day where there's this blue sky, the light illuminating the object looks kind of bluish. If you're indoors and you're by like a tungsten light bulb has kind of reddish light and you photograph that same object, it's lit by kind of reddish light. It's the same object, but it's under different lighting conditions. So a white object will be a different color, even though we say it's a white object, depending on the lighting that you are looking at it. So you have to define whether a color is scene referred or display referred. Nuke takes into account display reference as part of its definition of color space. Some things only take into account scene reference, i.e. the object is white rather than the object appears reddish on this screen because we took a photograph of it under reddish light. Uh, open Color IO, really great open source library for color management, uh, does all sorts of transforms and conversions. You can define color spaces. It considers things like eight bits, part of the definition of a color space in its config files. Vulkan, an API for doing GPU rendering, has a VK color space object, but the VK format enum also includes whether or not something is in the sRGB color space. So even within one API, there are different things that are kind of covering color space, but there's other pieces of data that cover the same thing. So it may cover whether it's a YUV or it's not an RGB image at all, whether it's 16 bits or eight bits, whether it's floating point or integer. Uh, FFmpeg uh, has a library called libavutil. There's a color space.h header uh, as part of that. It is almost entirely concerned with converting uh, between RGB and non-RGB formats. It does not care about this abstract concept of like, what is red in the abstract? Um, and this general definition I gave you uh, on the previous slide is just about gamut and transfer function. All of these definitions of color space are correct in different contexts, and you are going to wind up miscommunicating, and you are going to wind up driving yourself insane when you are Googling a very specific search term. And you're like, no, but I want to use this API's definition of color space in the context of figuring out how to use this other API I'm learning. Uh, and that will drive you insane, and that's just, that's a shame. I don't have a solution, there isn't one. Uh, so imaginary colors are a real thing? I mentioned you can define color spaces almost entirely arbitrary. Some are bigger than others. Some contain colors that others do not. Um, we treat a color mathematically as a vector, not a standard vector in C++ terms, a mathematical vector. Uh, and we transform colors using matrix multiplication. If you're not a math person, that'll be very boring. If you are a math person, you know that multiplying a vector by a matrix doesn't necessarily result in a number between zero and 100%. You can get negative colors. You can get colors greater than 100%. Uh, sometimes this is really useful. Sometimes this has crazy results. Uh, if you try and put one image over a background, you expect the foreground to obscure the background. If you have negative numbers in some of these images, you can wind up with an image that has negative opacity, and putting it over a background makes the background more prominent, which is Probably not what you want, but I don't know any of you. Maybe it is. Uh, if you're writing library code, you may need to put your images in floating point format in order to preserve negative numbers and things greater than 100%. Uh, but you may also need a trim function to clamp things between in floating point between zero and one uh, in 8-bit integer between zero and 255. What is correct depends entirely on context and you cannot dictate to users of your API. Uh, but you do wind up with like literal mathematical versions of it's redder than red or so black it sucked all the light out of the room or a reddish shade of green, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, and this is one of those slides I wish I had a ton more time to really expand on because it's an insane concept. Colors you can't see or even conceive of, but Mathematically in code, we may need to preserve those for the sake of people using APIs we work on. Uh, so, talk about images. Uh, moving pictures are a thing. Uh, I'm being recorded for YouTube now. It would be weird to deny the existence of moving pictures. Uh, the simplest mental model is that 
one frame of a moving picture of a video file is just a picture and there's no sort of crazy things we need to deal with in that context. And in a lot of cases, that's true. You can just sort of write image processing code that deals with an image and feed images into it sequentially. And in a lot of circumstances, that's as far as you need to go with it. Your single image processing program totally supports multiple images, just run it more than once. Uh, but that's not always true. Analog TV, as I mentioned, it was all based on voltages. We don't need to get into like the super details of it, but it didn't go down to 100%, it didn't go down to 0% voltage, and it didn't go up to 100% voltage for expressing the image for broadcast. So when we started doing digital video, we used an analog to digital converter and we captured that fact. And video that is captured digitally using this sort of philosophy, black is defined as code point 16 and white is 235. Eight bit integers go from zero to 255. There's just a bunch of slop space uh, this is kind of analogous if you are thinking in terms of strings, if you've ever had to clean seven-bit strings uh, for plain ASCII for sending email to really old servers or something. You just don't get to use the full range. And your images that you get that you need to work on may be full range, they may be video range, and some video was not captured in 10-bit. Uh, some stuff was done, or some, it is not necessarily all in 8-bit. Uh, 10-bit and even 12-bit video processing was very common, um, still is. Uh, using embedded hardware devices that is specifically built to handle 10-bit video, that's fine. Using general purpose computers like we program in C++, you don't have a 10-bit data type. So you wind up having to expand to 16 bits in order to work on 10 or 12-bit video. That potentially winds up doing fiddly bitwise hacking to unpack things if they are densely packed and do not uh, exist across byte boundaries. Okay, this is going to be super annoying. We've been talking about RGB for all of our colors so far, but that's not the only way to store colors. Old TV was black and white, not black and white like an original Macintosh, shades of gray. Uh, your eyes are bad at seeing color. There are interesting biophysics reasons for that. Uh, but you care more about how bright something is than what color it is. Uh, so in computers, uh, just like in your brain, we use less bandwidth for color. And we start with that brightness black and white image. And then we just sort of bolt on a little bit of color information to it. That was how they made color television. They were like, well, we, we can use a little more bandwidth on the spectrum as long as we don't use that much more for color. And we can kind of make it work for backwards compatibility with our signals because like I said, backwards compatibility lasts forever. We're still talking about uh, decisions that were made in the 1950s to enable color television. Uh, so this is the UV plane. Because we are not expressing colors in terms of red, green, and blue, we are expressing them in terms of brightness and then like bluish greenness versus like reddish greenness. And we're just defining greenness as the lack of U or V on this graph. Green winds up being implicit because we've got three channels, but only two of them are color. So we just make one of the colors implicit. It's fun. Uh, this is a specific image broken out. Uh, you can see in the top left, there is an image of a nice cabin in the mountains, green grass, bottom left, black and white picture, that one makes sense to you. Top right, color blue, and then bottom right, color red. And they're these sort of vague things. And the way we save disk space memory, bandwidth during broadcast, bandwidth on a tape, whatever format this exists is, we store the things on the right side of the image at half resolution. And it's fine, you don't notice. Your eyes are dumb. Uh, it, it works surprisingly well. Um, you can see, like, it's a very abstract thing. You, you mainly, when you look at this, you see the black and white image, and you're like, I can see what that is. Because of that, we have a notion of different planes of the image being different sizes. A color image only takes 150% of the storage space of a black and white image, which is cool. A red-green-blue format takes three times as much storage as just a black and white image. But this has huge implications on how you store and process data in memory. Uh, 
Um, there are many YUV formats. There are many ways to do this. This is not the only way, but this is what is called YUV 420 planar. Uh, the naming is obscure and kind of irrelevant. The point is, we started out with a simple mental model of an image structure class, one pointer to data, kind of like a vector or string in the C++ standard library. Now we have three pointers to data. One is a pointer to our luminance image, the brightness, the black and white one, and then we have two other pointers to the U-plane and the V-plane. Because they are not interleaved with the brightness, they exist sort of off in their own area of memory. They can be allocated completely separately. They can be allocated immediately after the brightness image, but they don't have to be. And we need some sort of functionality to keep tra track of the fact that the width of those color images is smaller than the brightness image. And if the slide were bigger, there would also be a UV height function there. You get the gist. It would be divided by two. This goes back to that a pixel is not a little square concept. Because when we are sampling from two different sizes of images, one pixel is different sizes of little squares from these sampled planes. And when we are trying to figure out pointer arithmetic for going through this, we have to iterate the pointer looking at luminance uh, four times as fast as looking at the color planes. That complicates writing an iterator for this kind of a data structure a lot. Uh, and if we're going to do it really well, we should be interpolating colors instead of just picking one and treating it as a smooth, blurry color plane instead of a blocky one. Again, I managed to avoid having to talk about that by defining this as not an algorithms talk. So I'm not going to tell you how to interpolate colors. Just vaguely say that you should. And if you ever wind up needing to, uh, there's tons and tons of papers about arguing about which way is best to do it. So we have things called GPUs in modern computers. These are special purpose hardware. They are for processing graphics. Uh, this is actually surprising to some of you who may have only used them for mining Bitcoin, but that was their original purpose is graphics. Uh, and we, pro we use these GPUs using APIs that are specifically designed for graphics. They take away some of the flexibility by implementing things in hardware. So there should be less to think about because we just have to do whatever the GPU wants. Unfortunately, there are many different kinds of GPUs, and they want to do a lot of weird things. There is an explosion of complexity when you wind up dealing with the GPU. Um, there are a zillion different pixel formats. You, when you're writing software, you can just kind of pick a pixel format and be like, I'm going to write my software to work like this. When you're dealing with a GPU, the GPU is going to have some subset of supported pixel formats, and you're going to have to store images in memory in a way that the GPU supports. And the two or three or four different models of GPU that you need to support may not all agree about which is best. Uh, they may have some mutually supported ones that overlap, but they may disagree about what is optimal. Also, we've had this idea of just running a pointer across scan lines of the image. You start at the top left, you go to the right, you go to the next row. That's not necessarily optimal depending on how you are using it. It is not necessarily cache friendly. If you are zoomed into an image where you can only see part of it, you don't want to have to iterate a pointer through space that is off screen, wasting memory bandwidth. You want to be cache coherent. You want to have locality of access. Those are all really valuable buzzwords when we're writing efficient code. And the pixel immediately below the pixel that you are currently accessing is fairly likely to be useful to you if you're writing a blur algorithm or sampling a texture or doing all sorts of things. Uh, the usage that you're actually doing uh, on a GPU, when you were doing 3D rendering, uh, there's textures, there's destinations that you render to, there's depth maps that you're storing sort of abstract data about the geometry of a scene and not just what color it is. Uh, and GPUs don't just necessarily have GPU memory. Uh, they have memory separate from the main CPU. There's actual physical RAM chips on the board that are separate from the RAM that your CPU talks to directly. But it may have multiple different banks of it, and you have to allocate in different places, and that doesn't match with like the C++ mental model of, I allocate memory with new, and I don't really care where it winds up. Uh, one of the interesting quirks of pixel formats on the GPU, 16-bit uh, half float. 
On CPUs, we have float. We have double. That's cool. But we don't have a 16-bit floating point format in C++ as part of the core language. Uh, on most desktop kinds of CPUs, this doesn't exist in hardware. It does exist in hardware as a data type on your GPU. And it is super useful because it takes up half as much space as 32-bit floats. And I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of circumstances where 0 to 255 doesn't cover everything you need to know about an image. If you need negative, if you need brighter than white, you want a floating point format, and gee, 32 bits times four per pixel is a lot more expensive than 16 bits. So if you can do that, it's pretty great. Um, Vulkan is an API I reference a lot when I'm talking about GPU stuff. It's not the only one. It's not necessarily the best, depending on what you're doing. It is fairly portable. Uh, the computer that you are using probably supports it in some way, at least through some sort of compatibility layer. You can use it on Windows, on Linux, on x86, on ARM. You can target phones with it. Uh, and also, compared to something like OpenGL, it exposes the ability to map memory directly. So you can get a pointer to GPU memory over the PCIe bus. So it's super cool for the kinds of things that the people who write C++ want to do. I want to write efficient low-level code where I can be aware of memory addresses and put things in efficient places. Vulkan's cool. Um, and it has a zillion pixel formats uh, that are slightly different. Um, I picked a couple of random ones just to kind of mention. I, I can't go through very many of them. But VK format, R8G8SRGB. We've defined SRGB as an RGB format. That is one that has only red and green, but no blue, but we're still calling it SRGB. That's kind of counterintuitive, but it's useful to only have two channels sometimes. There's red, green, blue, alpha, SRGB. That one makes sense. We've kind of been talking about that. There's red, green, blue, alpha, uint. That's actually the same underlying format uh, those are both 8-bit unsigned integer in memory. The sRGB tag for the pixel format affects how it reads it, but not how it stores it in memory. There's axes of differentiation in the way that these pixel formats are defined. Uh, R16G16S float, a, a signed floating point number of 16 bits per component. Does not exist on CPUs, super popular on GPUs, somewhat popular in some cases in software rendering stuff because it's smaller, but you have to go through indirection. Uh, ATSC is a compressed format. You cannot get a pointer to a pixel in a compressed format. It is stored and directly sampled on the GPU in the compressed format. If you want to poke at pixels in the CPU, you have to make a copy in an uncompressed format. And then this one's a very long name of an enum that I picked fairly arbitrarily. Uh, it is two-plane YUV, which is different than the three-plane YUV I talked about. It is 12 bits per component packed into 16-bit values. Hopefully you never have to deal with that. <laughs> but if you're dealing with 12-bit HDR video, you might have to because your source may be in that. And if you're dealing with big 8K video frames, wasting copies and converting between formats unnecessarily consumes a ton of CPU time and your thing stops running in real time. Um, to this effect, Libraries that are loading images off disk, if an image has things like compressed pixel formats in it, if you just want to dump that to the GPU, the library should not decode it. If you need to do anything with it on the CPU, the library should decode it so that you can poke at pixels with a pointer and say, I want that pixel to be red. The user's use case massively affects your API design decisions when you're doing something as simple as, I just want to load a file off disk and get it in memory. Isn't that a simple concept? Eh, not necessarily. Tiling. This relates to cache coherency. Sometimes you want to store formats in a weird zigzag pattern instead of from left to right. It makes memory access more cache coherent if you are sampling points up and down and left and right in a small 2D close together area. Um, yeah, it's a pain in the neck to deal with in CPU context. GPUs will sample that zigzag pattern directly. Mipmaps, another concept that relates to cache coherence. This is a whole bunch of different images that we call one image. You start with a full resolution image. 
then an image at half that resolution, then the same image at half that resolution, and half that resolution down to one pixel. If you are zoomed way out of an image and you only need to display a zoomed out, low resolution version of it, it is way more efficient to just sample from the already scaled down version. You don't want to scale it down every frame in an interactive application. This is another one of our many classic time-space trade-offs. You spend a bunch of extra memory storing scaled down copies of this image pre-computed, but at runtime it winds up being faster to get nice, nice, well-filtered results. Uh, and you just sort of have to be aware when you are making a class for your application that is going to store an image, you may need to store arbitrarily many copies of it depending on the resolution. And if you only know the resolution at runtime, the number of copies you need to store will only be known at runtime. Uh, you cannot make a completely general purpose image when you are dealing with the GPU. Uh, depth is handled different than color. When you allocate the memory, the memory access hardware in the GPU needs to know how it's going to be used so it can use different access modes. Uh, whether you are rendering to an image versus whether it is going to be a source you pull from in a rendering is completely different. Uh, if it's going to be sampled so it's smoothly interpolated to get like smooth values or it's going to be like Mario in the beginning where you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to access pixels individually. Uh, you can't necessarily recycle an image. In C++, we really like the idea of Oh, I have a moved from container that already has allocated memory. I can avoid doing a new allocation. Uh, I could recycle an image in my arena allocator uh, in game development. They'll sometimes really avoid doing dynamic allocation at runtime at all. Uh, but you can't necessarily recycle images in the GPU context because you promised the GPU it would only be used one way. And at runtime, if you later decide, oh, actually, I really want to do something else. Uh, sorry, allocate a new image. You, you did it wrong. Uh, and you'll have to ping pong between images back and forth and stuff. You can't just recycle it. Uh, and that has implications on how general purpose uh, an image class in your application can be. Uh, oh, yeah, this is back to pixel formats. Uh, there is a combinatorial explosion of complexity based on a particular format is supported, but only for a certain usage. But for this other usage, only this other pixel format is supported. And this all varies by GPU and potentially GPU driver that you were using, an NVIDIA card on Windows using the NVIDIA drivers may have different supported pixel formats than that exact same card. If you're using open source drivers on Linux because different implementations, Sorry, your application will need to just kind of be aware of some of this. It'll need to be aware of some of it at runtime. You can't test 100% of this ahead of time because they're going to release a new GPU tomorrow. And even if you don't upgrade to new hardware, you're going to download new drivers. And you may get new features and things will change. Uh, so yeah, there's combinatoric explosion of all of these various quirks of the GPU and the way that they interact together. And I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the other thing is heaps. Uh, there are physical pools of memory. Uh, if you've dealt with NUMA and allocating memory in CPUs, it's worse. Uh, there are special libraries just for memory allocation in the GPU in Vulkan. Uh, there is one called VMA that is the Vulkan memory allocator. It's super cool, but if you are designing some sort of general purpose API, they're like, well, I'll just present a really easy API for my user and I'll handle all the allocation. The user may have some very hard requirements on where exactly their images are so that they can be mapped over buses and they're contiguous with other things, you will need to allow users to supply their own allocators and that complicates any API design. Uh, so GPU and video. We, we mentioned video, we mentioned GPU. Uh, what happens when we get the chocolate on the peanut butter? Is it better or is it worse? Uh, it's even more complicated. Uh, GPUs have hardware decoding for video. Super cool. You upload raw video to the GPU and it will create like a texture that you can draw on the screen from. In a naive API where you're trying to make simple wrappers that are general purpose, you're going to make an API that reads a video file, spits out an image in CPU memory. If you want to add GPU hardware decoding to that API, you're going to upload to the GPU download from the GPU back into CPU memory, and then your user will need to upload that back into the GPU so that they can actually display it on screen so somebody can see it. That's wasteful. 
we want to avoid wasteful copies. Uh, you know, we use string view rather than string to avoid unnecessarily copying hundreds of bytes. An image can be hundreds of megabytes at very large resolutions and exotic pixel formats. You want to avoid copies, so you need to complicate your API. So sometimes you just return a handle to some sort of GPU object and say, I didn't give you pixels. Hopefully that's good. Because uh, sometimes the user wants a simple API that just gives them pixels that they can use in memory because they're not actually doing anything with the GPU. Um, so yeah, and if you have an image on the GPU that you want to process, there's no easy slash good way to run C++ directly on your GPU, so you need to port all of your processing code to compute shaders, which is another thing that is wildly out of scope for this talk, but you're at a C++ conference, so you were hoping to do all of your image processing in C++. That's an extra layer of complexity you didn't want to deal with, but it's far more efficient if you're doing the decoding in hardware on the GPU to do all the processing before you display it in hardware on the GPU without making extra copies. Uh, another problem when you deal with video on the GPU is the GPU will have some documented support of listed codecs. Your user does not necessarily use one of the codecs that your GPU hardware supports. If they happen to you know, only use codecs that uh, you can support on GPUs today, they will need a new video format next week and you will be scrambling to do it. So you're going to need to make paths that Okay, if you want your thing to wind up on the GPU and the GPU supports it, then you'll get a handle to GPU memory. Otherwise, we'll have to fall back to a CPU path. There's a bunch of conditional complexity logic that is only resolvable at runtime based on what hardware the user has. Uh, and that complicates any sort of API design for what you're gonna do with this video, what the frame is. If the user just wants to write it out as a JPEG, they might not care about any of this GPU stuff. If you, you know, work at a company where you need to put a new buzzword on the sticker, you might need to say it's GPU accelerated so you can sell this year's copies. Uh, I don't know. Um, so I started talking about uh, there is a proposal for 2D graphics as core in the C++ language. Um, what does C++ really need? Honestly, I don't know. I've waffled about this, I've thought about it. I don't have a real specific coherent proposal about, proposal about, proposal about what should be supported at the language level. Uh, as much as any jerk with an internet connection, I have some opinions uh, that I can share to sort of preempt uh, a question that may come up. Uh, one is that it'll be impossible to please everybody. I've sort of talked about you know, but what if your image is from a video file but is being decoded by a hardware GPU decoder but, and the user is gonna run a compute shader? Like that's a fairly obscure use case. I flagged it that your users may need it, but a lot of users won't. Uh, so balancing trying to please everybody, not gonna work. Uh, human perception is impossible to do correctly. I've glossed over a ton of stuff about that, but looking at an image is a whole other ball of wax from just having an image exist in the computer, representing it, being able to process it. GPUs are super complex. I showed you like some of just the Vulkan pixel format enums are a mile long. You don't wanna integrate all of Vulkan into C++ and if you did, people would argue, well, why Vulkan, why not OpenGL, why not DirectX? And they'd be right. Uh, I'd also say keep algorithms out of scope. Uh, the current 2D graphics proposal that I've seen includes a lot of like, here's code to draw a circle, here's code to draw a line, here's code to draw fonts uh, and text, and that's... <laughs> Someone has tried to deal with a font uh, at some point in their life, and uh, if we could just take a moment to be sympathetic for, for uh, our fellow audience member. Um, if we have a vocabulary type, then you can use other libraries to do things. We may need some sort of data structure representing an image in the language, uh, but it doesn't need to do everything. We don't need to start with user input. We don't need to start with event loops. We don't need to start with windowing. We may need an image, but like I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. Like I threw imaginary colors at you and you were all like, what? Uh, and then I just moved to the next slide. Uh, just dealing with what an image is, is 
really complex to do in a way that is general enough for all C++ developers working with images to do. So leave a bunch of stuff out of scope if we're gonna add anything to the language. What should we do? I like string view as a mental model, but when we're dealing with graphics, view implies you can actually see it. Uh, like in cute APIs, a view implies an on-screen widget, so we can't call it a view like a string view. Uh, naming things is hard. But uh, C++ is working on a generalized concept of view with span. Uh, we also have weak pointers, so like a non-owning image where if I read an image from the disk with one library, I can generate a weak span of pixels that is non-owning. And then I can use that in any other library that does support the C++ standard data type. But it doesn't need to be responsible for some of the weird allocation stuff if I'm doing something stupid with a GPU or if it has come from some other library that does its own allocation. Um, I think a vocabulary, vocabulary type would be useful glue between all these weird libraries that have different definitions of things. YUV planar formats are a real pain to support, but maybe don't support them explicitly. Like just kind of punt and support one plane in the standard image type and just say, and just make a vector of images and they'll sort of be their own thing. Uh, and one thing I think would be super duper cool to add to the C++ core language is a 16-bit half float data type. Uh, compiler people would hate that because CPU hardware doesn't support it, but there are a ton of circumstances writing image processing code where that is a really, really useful format to have and uh, being able to effectively double the amount of memory you've got is a valid time-space trade-off uh, in terms of the complexity of unpacking the 16-bit float into a 32-bit register and vice versa. So a better definition from what we started with is not A. Uh, we, we sort of were wrong with the first letter, but arbitrarily many, not necessarily contiguous, not necessarily 2D, but like n-dimensional arrays of, they're not little squares, we learned that, that's actually kind of important even for the level we're looking at, but uh, arbitrarily many n-dimensional arrays of pixels with some number of some kind of data type that may be an integer but might be float and could be interpreted in various ways. Uh, possibly RGB colors, but I don't know what that means and not necessarily. Uh, or it could just be arbitrary data like a depth map or an alpha channel that represents opacity rather than color. Uh, stored in a computer, but not necessarily the CPU memory, could be the GPU's memory. Uh, and then uh, you access it through some sort of arbitrarily complex thing that may involve indirections through multiple planes and memories or Z tiling orders or tiled storage formats where you get to a tile, the end of a tile and then jump to some other data structure. Uh, but a lot of that access pattern can be hid with C++ iterators. Um, iterators are a pain to write, but once you do that, you can write code for pixel colon image and then process the pixels and make that totally oblivious to how exactly the pixels are stored. That is one nice thing about C++ and the way it can hide some of the implementation details with iterators in just any range-based for loop. Uh, so thank you. I hope you enjoyed my lightning talk. I was talking pretty quickly, so it's still kind of a lightning talk. Uh, I didn't get super in-depth on some of this stuff, if I'm being honest. Uh, you now know enough about digital images to cover kind of useful 90% and uh, learning the other 10% will take a bit longer. I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, what I got. I have run through most of the time. Hopefully uh, you weren't rushing off anywhere. Uh, do we have time for uh, questions now? Uh, all right. Uh, were there any questions that popped up in the uh, chat or do we want to start with uh, people here? Great, I explained it perfectly. Nobody has any questions about how any of this works. Uh, anybody here have? I, I have lights in my eyes. I, I see a hand over there. Ah, excellent. Um, when you are doing 3D rendering in a game, uh, the texture maps are sampled. There is a piece of hardware in the GPU called a sampler that smoothly interpolates 
the image in memory. Uh, if you remember the way really old PlayStation 1 games looked versus Nintendo 64 games, Nintendo 64 games had like a really smooth look for their textures even though they were low resolution. And PlayStation 1 games were very blocky, chunky, pixelated kind of look for their textures. Uh, the N64 sampled the texture, did an interpolation on it. Storage, if you were running arbitrary code on your GPU, you're not using it as a texture. You're not necessarily using it as an image. You're using it as some big buffer, maybe integer, maybe floating point. You're possibly using it as an image, and you want to write to it in arbitrary ways. That's a storage image. You're treating it basically the way you would treat an arbitrary buffer in CPU memory without any of this specialized access where we're interpolating values. Uh, does that help? Cool. Uh, all right. I've still got kind of lights in my eyes. So if, if you are trying to raise your hand, one question. Raise a lot. Uh, Boost GIL. It looked quite promising. Any opinion on it? Uh, GIL, I have not worked with seriously. Uh, it's very templatey from what I remember. Um, the projects I've worked on haven't already had it as a dependency, so I haven't been forced to learn it, and I can't comment on it in great depth. Templating some of this stuff, super valuable, um, but like I said, some things dealing with really generic image stuff, you kind of have to discover at runtime when you're dealing with kind of compressed image formats that you can't access pixels out of directly. So I'm sure it solves some super cool problems that its users find great. Uh, I just, there's a ton of libraries out there, so I don't have a lot of useful uh, commentary on it. Uh, anybody else? That is a wonderful question, uh, which could apply industry-wide with a terrible answer. Um, no. Um, <laughs> users would basically be really upset if the photo CD that they burned in 1996 had an expiration date. If uh, you know, you're going through old things that you inherit uh, 50 years from now, it would be a real shame if you were like, oh, well, no software can read my childhood pictures. That, that stinks. Moving on, uh, there will continue to be users who want to deal with this stuff. I mentioned retro computing. I mean, people are still writing brand new video games for the original Nintendo Entertainment System and for Atari consoles and things. Uh, we still build our railroad gauges. There's some possibly apocryphal meme based on sort of how wide ranks of Roman soldiers rode uh, in, during the Roman Empire. Backwards compatibility is unfortunately a constraint that will exist forever. <laughs> Unless you can arrange a more thorough apocalypse than the ones we've had so far. <laughs> Which, let me know. <laughs> Somebody, I can't read that card from back here. All right, uh, the man with the card has said the session is over. Thank you very much. Uh,